Welcome to Thrive Radio. I'm your host, Amy Montgomery, entrepreneur and digital marketing agency owner. Today, my guest is Alex Sharp. He's a cybersecurity and digital transformation consultant. He is aligning the business, cybersecurity, and governance to make businesses stronger and people's lives better. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Amy. Yeah. So how did you become an expert in cybersecurity and start your own consulting business? What's your journey? What's your, has your journey look like? Oh man, there's a lot in that question. So the, it's one of those things, right? My career has been a series of unexpected phone calls. What happened is right out of college, I got my dream job working for the intelligence community. And I ended up in on the offensive side that got recruited over to defense, which we now call cybersecurity, right? At the time, the term information security was just coming out and it was an evolving world, right? The internet was not known to many people, starting to be ready to take off. So I got into that field in a very deep way in a very exclusive community that was really where all this was coming together at the time. Very fortunate to work with a lot of foundational concepts and companies and all very fortunate. And uh, one day, like I said, my career is based in unanticipated phone calls. Then one day I got a call from, believe it or not, one of the subcontractors that was working for me. They were becoming part of a new practice that was being built at one of the large consulting firms, Booz Allen Hamilton. And I was like, great. Sounds cool. Let me know when you land. I would love to keep in touch and see if I could get some more work. We worked together, said, no, no. Do you want to come over and help us build this new business unit? I was like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. So thinking about it a little while, I ended up going over there and that led me down the road of getting indoctrinated into the world of management consulting, where I did a lot of strategy work. I ended up running what we would now call digital transformation for another large firm, KPMG in the mid-Atlantic. Ended up running some national relationships for them. Again, another phone call just out of somebody I worked with said, hey, we're building this practice. Do you want to come over and lead it? I was like, sure. Then another phone call where some folks were starting up a firm called the Hacker Group, which is still exists today. I was a founder there, ended up running a $60 million business unit for them. We went public. It was a great ride, great experience. And then got a call from an executive recruiter. Hey, this firm got some venture capital funding and they'd like to expand across the country. Do you want to take over the East Coast? I was like, Sure, why not? And then that led into running global operations. So it's it was one of those things where I started out in the cyber business when we didn't even call it cyber. It was not really known to a lot of people. And then I ended up getting the management consulting strategy side, a lot of digital focus because of my cyber experience. And it just happened. It was, I think... It, I was telling one of my colleagues this, actually one of the guys who called me, we're still very good friends. And it was like, it's luck. And he's, it's not luck. It's like waking up every morning, doing all the right things, connecting with the right people. So when something cool comes up, they think of you. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I like that. I didn't know I was doing that, but I guess I got to keep it up for a while. So when it comes to technology strategy, what would be wise of most businesses to focus on right now, especially considering things like cyber attacks, which are new for many of us to start to hear about? Yeah. All right. So again, you're asking a lot of, there's a lot in that question. Okay. So (laughs) what most people think about technology, they hear technology, but where the value comes is not in the technology itself. It's what you wrap around it. So if you look at how technology gets adopted, believe it or not, there's actually very defined, or I shouldn't say defined, but there's very well-known steps about how it goes through different phases of adoption. Jeffrey Moore did a lot of work around this. Joseph Schumpeter, who is considered the father of innovation, has a thing referred to as Schumpeter's Gale, which is creative destruction that you have to give up with went on before 
So for example, digital photography put Kodak out of business. You want to guess who owned the patents to digital photography? Who? Kodak. Oh, wow. Oh yeah. That's an interesting one because they did not want to cannibalize their own business to go down this new road. They just wouldn't do it. Whereas Apple, to create the smartphone, actually cannibalized the iPod by combining the iPod and phone into what we now call a smartphone. Another one, do you go with the graphical interface that you and I are both staring at right now? Who created that? Just guess. Microsoft? No. Xerox created the graphical user interface, the mouse, integrated circuits. They created all this stuff, but they saw no use for it, so they gave it away. They wow. literally gave it away. Wow. So what it really comes down to when you're dealing with technology, it's really understanding it's the process, the people, the business models. The business model is very key that you wrap around it that unlocks the value. And when you're talking about mitigating your risk, particularly your cyber risk, it comes down to how do you govern it? And what we have found over a couple hundred years of tracking this stuff, humans have been around somewhere between two and 300,000 years. Economists will tell you that human productivity, two thirds of human productivity is driven through technology. And looking at the trends over time, lots of data, it shows that when technology is coming out as a new thing, and that's where where it's starting to be adopted and starting to figure out what to do with it. If we put some guard rails around it, not firm governance, if we put some guard rails around it so it does, you don't drive off the road, it tends to foster adoption because it's building trust without, it's taking the bottom out of it. So it's limiting your risk. And that's actually one of the things that's the industry, or I should say, Parts of the industry are trying to do with things like non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and cryptocurrencies. I'm actually working on some of this regulatory stuff where if we pro provide enough of a sandbox around it, where we reduce the risk and make it less painful, but we allow innovation and exploration, we're going to come up with some new ideas and some inventive strategies and foster adoption in ways we've never seen before. That's a lot of what's happened with the cloud. The other thing that tends to happen in this stuff, as you can tell, you got on one of my favorite subjects. What tends to happen is we need an accelerator. We need an accelerator for adoption. Probably the greatest accelerator in our lives is gonna turn out to be COVID. So many things was accelerated during COVID. And we have found that on average, once you hit about 20, 18 to 20% of industry adoption on something, it tends to become the de facto standard. And a lot of that work was done by Jeffrey Moore in, in what he called crossing the chasm. It's turned out to be true. I probably gave you a lot more than you were looking for in that question, but it's one of these things that when people and companies tend to embrace this and understand it, or at least they get it intuitively, those are the companies that tend to accelerate. The ones who don't tend to disappear. Yeah, I think that it's so interesting because even in that, I, the growing pains of especially the new technology that you walk through okay. and there's those that are just like, don't change it. This, I love it the way <laughs> it is. And they're like, they're ruining it. But at the same time, you're right. There, there has to be some governance to things so that they just don't end up being disastrous. Cause you think of things like Bitcoin and, and I have minimal understanding of how all of it works, but you would think that if there's at some point, not something that's not regulating it, it opens up a whole lot of other things. Like, is that going to now compete with our main currents? And if it does compete, okay, how do we merge with that to actually utilize it versus fighting the change? And yeah, it's interesting. It is. It is. In that particular subject, we're at a couple of very interesting inflection points. So the Gensler, who's the chairman of the SEC, the current chairman of the SEC used to teach digital currency at MIT. And it's a unique time to have that go on. Currencies are also, a, it's just a fascinating world. Like I mentioned, I'm working on some regulatory work around in the space right now. 
And one of the things I keep telling people, which seems to be a hard concept, some people grasp onto it intuitively, others tend to struggle with it, is mm -hmm. bits don't have borders. So when you're dealing with a currency or something of stored value, like a Bitcoin or an NFT, you can't tell it where not to go. It doesn't know lines that are drawn on a map. It doesn't have a GPS. It can go anywhere. So like in today's financial system, because of the way it's organized, we can actually limit where funds are sent and how they're sent. You can't really do that in a decentralized financial world. It's, it's a very different world. Also, the value that is, can be realized in so many ways is through the roof. One South American country actually adopted decentralized finance because one of the largest inflows of cash into their country is from their citizens that live in the United States and send money back to their families. And what sense. they've done is they've adopted the use of crypto because it reduces the middleman, it reduces the waste, and it reduces any loss. Because what these folks used to do was they would go to a local convenience store and hand somebody in money and wire it. And you can only imagine how many, with all the hands touching it, how much got lost. Yeah. And most uh, of them don't bank, right? That's exactly it. That's exactly right. So you've got these situations where the unbanked or the underbanked can actually make use of this stuff in a really big way, but you don't want them to be abused. You don't want somebody to take advantage of them. And that's where a lot of these regulatory environments come in and they really do some good. Yeah. We're also seeing some countries who don't have the infrastructure like we do in the United States that are using these decentralized models to get around the lack of the infrastructure, right? They don't have the paved roads or a major rainstorm takes out the major highway and, and you can no longer get crops to market. Now you can form these little cells within these communities because they don't need that infrastructure any longer. Or you can find ways of communicating to reroute organized response. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. It's a pretty cool thing. But there again, without the guardrails around it, especially in the early days, because this stuff is being adopted in ways that were never imagined. So history-wise, we talk about adoption. What we're talking about now around crypto are actually technologies and patents that were awarded in the 70s. Most wow. people don't realize that some of this stuff is 50 years old. The term blockchain was coined in 1992. And the only fundamental change that's really happened in the space has been the distributed ledger, which was around 2001, 2002. So this new stuff is really not that new. These are long-term concepts, but now that they're feasible because the communication infrastructure is there, the cost of technology is coming down, the cost of store data is close to zero at this point. The more data we generate, the cheaper it becomes to generate and store. It's, it data is the new oil, but the evolution, or I should say revolution, in the innovation that comes out, what people are doing and how they're doing it is just fantastic. We just need to be sure to create these guardrails that ensure the safety of the people that are in these organizations, but at the same time, we don't limit them. Another area like that right now is artificial intelligence. There is There's so many potential bad roads we can end up going down with artificial intelligence, even just people's perceptions. Corporations are looking at how to create these governance programs where they basically put their AI programs in a sandbox. So if something bad happens, it doesn't go too far afield. Yeah, and, yeah. and working with it. And well, again, a lot of it is perception and accidental. It's, yeah. As you can well, tell, I enjoy this stuff. Yeah, and the AI, some of that, honestly, some of it freaks me out because if I see some stuff that creeps me out, then that means that there's probably a whole lot of a lot of other things I haven't seen that exist because <laughs> you know that there's always this stuff that's going on behind the scenes. But I've heard like Elon Musk saying that he had concerns that like 
AI would be like taking over and all of that. And yeah, so I can understand why the regulatory is so needed and those guardrails and to keep the creativity going and let the create be creative, but have this framework in place so that the creativity doesn't stop, but it protects. Yeah, I agree with you. I love this stuff. Growing up, some of my childhood heroes included folks like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Edison. And if you look at the stuff that they went through, they had these same concerns about the technologies you were dealing with. Thomas Edison was famously against alternating current because he thought it was gonna be such a safety issue. It's in everybody's homes. We've learned how to deal with it over time. Yeah. And that's the same with AI. AI is very different in a number of ways. And one of them is it's much more intangible and it has a lot worse movies running around, right? Yeah. I've often thought that we should create some sort of like movie factor, this misperceptions that come out of movies. By the way, a bit of trivia, Bit of trivia. Name the person who is largely credited with being the first AI visionary. It's a woman by the name of Ada Lovelace. She's very famous for a lot of things. As a matter of fact, as a nod to her vision, some years ago, the U.S. government was trying to create a very powerful language mostly used for defense, and they named it Ada after her. It didn't catch on largely because commercial adoption, but it fostered a lot of other things like Java and some other programs that are out there today. But she actually existed before the Civil War. So what she what we call artificial intelligence these days is something that she actually imagined and envisioned, and she's credited to be, I think the official term is one of the first software programmers. It's a pretty interesting history. And then have you ever seen the movie, The Imitation Game? I don't think um, I have. Okay. It's a pretty good movie. They, it's pretty historically accurate by all accounts. That was during the Second World War, the U.S. created, going back to the cybersecurity stuff, the U.S. and Britain collaborated on creating a effectively a modern computing system to break the German naval codes. So we knew where the U-boats were and we could reverse the war. I like, need to watch that. It sounds, I love that kind of stuff. I geek out on it. Well, I'm the type of person that's, oh, there's a code that nobody's ever been able to figure out. Let me figure it out. Well, there's, <laughs> so there's two you might want to look at. The one is the code that is in a monolith in the middle of the Pentagon. It's supposed to be an unbreakable code that somebody will figure out someday. And then the other one is the letters from the Zodiac Killer that have still never been reverse engineered. But back to the imitation game, Turing, who was the lead scientist behind that, after the Second World War, he set out and wrote a paper that caused a whole flurry of investment, which is considered to be the foundational work in artificial intelligence. And his, the first chapter in his paper was called The Imitation Game. So they named the movie after his paper that really didn't do anything with Enigma, but it did more to start what we now call artificial intelligence. And down that road, when I give talks about this, about how do you put governance programs in place and what do you do with AI and offense and defense and all that. One of the things I like to bring up is a lot of stuff that we're doing today are based on algorithms that were developed in the 80s and the 90s. The difference is we finally have the computing power and the data to actually train the algorithms. It's a very fascinating field. And then when you start looking at things like autonomous vehicles and just the error rates that we need and the level of sophistication that goes into that, it's pretty mind numbing what we can do. Yeah. It really is. It's just amazing. It's it, incredible. It, if you like to geek out, this is great stuff to geek out. <laughs> I do, I geek out on it. I always have, even when I was at a big four and I'd always hear all, this kind of, of content that people were talking about and former FBI there talking about cool stuff. I'd always be like, it's the spy stuff. And they're like, no, Amy, it's not spy stuff. I'm like, yeah, but I call it spy stuff. <laughs> it's the cool stuff. I used to want to work for the FBI and I actually applied, but they wouldn't accept me because I have two plates, 15 pins and screws in my arm. And Oh, 
Yeah. Cause I was in a car accident. So I'm a little bit too metal. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to be an assistant, just be around this stuff. But yeah, oh, I the, geek out um, on all that. The FBI has, their mission has changed significantly. I've done a fair amount of work with them mm -hmm. and there's some really, they do some really cool stuff that never makes it out into the public. Oh um, yeah, I bet. Yeah. I and mean, even some of the, I've enjoyed some people that have come that have worked in it and then published books. There's one book called the like switch that was written by a former FBI agent. And it talks about charisma and all that. That was the most fascinating book. Yeah, it is. I think I have that on my shelf. There's another one about body language. Yeah. That was written by, I can't remember the name of it. I can picture the cover and it's probably 30 feet in that direction in another room, but that stuff is fantastic. Plus the work they're doing now around cyber crime and e-forensics and e-discovery, it's shocking what they can do. Yeah. I can only you know, imagine. Yeah. It's amazing. And we need it. Yeah. We need it for this modern world. I've joked sometimes that Alan Pinkerton, who's considered to be the father of the modern detective agency. I wonder if he appeared today, would he recognize this world? Oh yeah, because the technology has changed so much. So the things that they even just slightly tapped into now is so beyond. Yeah, it, it is. And then the implications of a lot of what we're dealing with, it, it didn't make a huge amount of news, but um, Facebook was looking at basically encrypting end to end all communications from one person to another. And one of the major reasons, who knows what conversations happen behind the scenes, but publicly what Facebook stated is one of the reasons they didn't do it was because by, you're talking about artificial intelligence and good stuff that goes on, the analysis that they do without law enforcement sticking their nose in, the analysis that F Facebook and some of the other social media organizations do around looking for child abuse, sex trafficking, illegal kidnapping, because people were communicating over Facebook. I know the one statistic, I wish I had it in front of me now, that the Center for Missing and Abused Children, some almost all of their leads comes from social media, where the social media organizations actually have trained their algorithms to look for this stuff. And there was a commentary by one of the senior executives from it was either law enforcement or the center had actually talked about they're getting more leads and the quality of the leads are so much better than they've ever seen before. Yeah. I, so they didn't want to, Facebook had decided not to shut that down because it was part of the social good that we, we should all do. So interesting. It's amazing with all of that. Yeah. There is a lot of good that can help a lot of people. And I think that sometimes it's easy to forget that, especially with everything that has gone on in the news and stuff and the last few years of demonizing Facebook and all of that. I think that you have to step back and also remember the good stuff that's going on. It's like we were talking about a little bit ago, right? Advances in technology, the technology could be used for good or bad. And a lot of it comes down to the business model you wrap around it, but it also comes down to, I hate to say it, the public relationships and the marketing you do. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, I, I like studying history. I'm a closet historian and a closet economist, because if you look at some major inventions that have been put out there, I read something once that talked about the machine gun was actually invented or progressed by clergymen because he thought it was such a forceful weapon. It would prevent all wars because the cost would be too high. Was, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> and then there's other nuances around, I think it was dynamite, the same thing. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. We talked about Thomas Edison, who knows when he created the phonograph, apparently some of the original marketing around the phonograph was that it allowed people to listen to Sunday morning sermons would actually have having to be in church on the Sunday. They can listen to it throughout the week. Who knows if that's the real business case or it was really good marketing. Yeah. But either way, it's changed the world. It is so amazing. So as businesses focus on growing, what should they be considering when it comes to risk? All right. First of all, risk is an inherent part of everything we do and an inherent part of every business. 
It's an excellent question. I think it was the founder of Twitter that said an entrepreneur is somebody who's willing to jump off a cliff knowing they're gonna grow wings. And I think that's absolutely true. The, in having built a couple businesses myself, I've built businesses inside of existing organizations. I built two businesses from the ground up. I've done my own thing. I've worked with a lot of others. I think the number one thing to keep in mind is the amount of risk that's appropriate for your stage in development. And you can never be reckless. There is a huge difference between being aware of your risk and treating it and being reckless. Hope and prayer is never a strategy. Ignoring it is never a strategy. <laughs> no, never ignore. Now, knowing that you may not be able to know how to deal with it today, or it might be a problem further out, doesn't mean you ignore it. It means you're collecting your data, you're doing your homework, you're continuously learning. And when you get there, hopefully you've done enough preparation you can deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Risk is an inherent part of everything we need to do. I encourage entrepreneurs to understand what risk is and that there are four categories of risk treatment. You accept, you avoid, you mitigate, you transfer, understand how each of them fits, but more importantly, understand what level of risk is appropriate for where you are. So if you're in the very, very early stages of a drug development and you're doing pure research, this stuff is usually funded by the government because it's so risky, nobody else will do your research, do everything you do, but make sure you retain your intellectual property rights, at least to some level, because these are really your thoughts and ideas and all. So move forward. That is a very different risk profile than when you're in a production phase. When you're in a production phase, your actual craft about the research and all is not as important. You're gonna be scrambling to look for people who know how to build a production line. You're gonna look for people that know what has to be on that bottle, what approvals you need, what licenses you need, how to tailor it for different markets, how to distribute, how to preserve it. Those are very different skills than doing the bio research. The other thing I always tell entrepreneurs, and I'm gonna bring this up because it's top of mind, especially now with all the conversations about going back to work and being short on hiring and the unemployment rate being low, is it's very important, especially in the earlier stages, to hire quality people around you that can complement your skills. Entrepreneurs, I, I sometimes get blowback when I say this, entrepreneurs often make the classic mistake of hiring weaker versions of themselves. Yeah. They know their craft inside and out, and boy, do they know their craft. And because they know their craft better than anybody else, they hire people that also know the craft, but by definition, they don't know it as well as they do. They hire weaker versions of themselves when they really need people to focus on the operations, the marketing, the finance, the legal, all that other stuff. And that I think in some sense, it's scary for them. Because how do I know if I'm hiring the right person? You got to build your network and you got to look, you got to check on values and you got to educate yourself. This is one of the glories and disasters of being an entrepreneur. Frankly, it's one of the things I love about it is being able to, when you're building a company, your fingers are in all pies at all times. And it's really cool to know everything that's going on. And then over time, you get to migrate into what makes the most sense for you to do. And it really causes a lot of self-reflection to say, okay, what are the things that only I can do? Okay, yeah. my goal then becomes, I make sure that I'm doing the things that only I can do. And I'm surrounding me with people that do the other things far better than I can. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I grew up, because my dad worked for Tony Robbins since I was 13. That's right. That's right. I always forget that. I got yeah. I got to keep remembering that. So I got a little bit of this leadership talk from a young age. So when I stepped in my first a CMO position, I was ready for all the intelligent people to be around me. And <laughs> just you tell me this is this is what I want to accomplish. How are we going to get it done? And 
I think that in my business now, even though my business is not a full year old, as far as full to being full time in it. And I think that's one thing that I feel that I've been a little bit different than the majority is I outsourced immediately because I was used to being the strategist and then waiting and letting the worker bees, the people that are really good at video and the person's person that's really good at graphics and the person over here. And so it's been a process of, okay, I need to find those people ASAP Yep. because I know what my strengths are and it's so easy to get caught in the weeds. So one of the exercises, and let me get in my little geek side, my business side. Whenever you have a business, whatever stage you're at, whether you realize it or not, you're making a decision about what your core competencies are. What's core to your business? And as you go through that process, the only things you should ever outsource You should never outsource your core. Anything else is subject to being outsourced. These days, I'm having a lot of those conversations, particularly around the cloud. Which applications should we send out to the cloud? Okay. I'll usually work with them to create a three to five selection criteria. And on there is always a question about is it core to your business? And the first reaction is everything is core to our business. No, it's not. No, it's not. And by the way, Mr. Company, who I shall keep your name out of it, if everything was core to the business, you would not be in business because your business is to outsource certain functions to you. They're like, okay, good point. So you need to decide when you're in business, what is your secret sauce? And then in times of disruption, this becomes incredibly important. So if you look at, I like using historical examples because they tend to have lots of data and you could do some research on it. As the internet came around, you'll notice that encyclopedia manufacturers, whatever you call them, publishers, a lot of them went out of business because they thought publishing books was their core competency where others looked at it and said, no, our core business is information. So for us, we can abandon or pull back the book publishing and the book sales part of the business. And we can make use of this new medium that's cheaper, faster, and has a broader reach. They're the ones that succeeded. Apple, everybody looks around at their Apple phone Apple doesn't consider the hardware manufacturing a core competency of theirs. They outsource that, but they don't outsource the look and feel. Yeah. They don't outsource their ecosystem. And I'm guilty of this. I'm a sucker for it because for me, being a technologist, I don't believe technology is for technology's sake. I want it to make my life better, easier. So I like my Apple products because they all work together and they come with an ecosystem. So today I needed a particular app to do something for a project without even giving it another thought. I had my smartphone in front of me. I went on the Apple store there and there was like six of them. Yeah. Apple doesn't create all their own apps, but they we were talking about before they've created a governance program that anybody who puts an app on their store must conform to security, usability, all this other stuff. You're relatively safe. They have this peer review system on there that helps you select your apps, right? You look at the number of people who are reviewed it and the ratings and all. They don't outsource those mechanics, but they outsource the development and say, if you want to play in our sandbox, you have to conform to this. So going back to our original discussion, they've really reduced the risk on a number of levels. It reduces the risk. It increases the likelihood of you being able to find something you need. And it reduces the risk of it doing something really bad to your phone. Yeah. It's along the lines of the ecosystems, the business ecosystem. So that's how you grow now. Oh, yeah. Instead of just being the big business, it's the Amazon where they have all the people giving them the merchandise. They have all the stores that are working together. 
And I think that was part of the reason when I started my agency, I immediately white labeled with an agency that's been around for 15 years to do a lot of the work. And they had all the systems in place and onboarding people is wonderful. They have a great experience. And then, Mm -hmm. and there's tons of services available on top of what I can only do myself. And I knew that was going to be the easiest way for me to grow and not have to turn anyone away. That's an excellent strategy. It's an excellent strategy. And it's also a strategy that you can morph and adapt as you grow. Yeah. And I could sell off pieces. If I wanted to sell off a certain piece that was of work that they, the type of work that they do, I could sell that off to another agency and they could take over those accounts and be very easy because they're in a, an external system. It's not something that I necessarily own. Right. There you go. So Perfect. that would be very easy. Yeah. It's just, especially that I'm 50. So I have to think of if I succeed and I get to 70, what pieces am I going to sell off? <laughs> All right. There's a lot of people listening to this podcast. I'm going to throw out two pieces of, of advice. Now, my policy on advice or recommendations and consulting, whatever I give the people in short is what you do with it is totally up to you. I just ask you to listen. Right. So just throwing it out there for free and what everybody wants to do. We talked about how these networks and these ecosystems are the new way. The my go to book on this is called The Network is Your Customer by David Rogers. It's I think it puts it all together. And one of the reasons I like his work, other than I'm a fan of David's and he's a good speaker, he's a good educator, he does a lot of good work. He puts out a lot of practical examples. So I think entrepreneurs who know their craft really well and they're trying to get their head around some of this stuff, there's a lot of textbooks out there and business school stuff that aren't as relatable. David's work is a lot more relatable. So I I recommend it to folks who need to be business aware, but not necessarily business school academic. So that's always a very important thing. So here's another piece of advice. I, I don't know why. I don't know why, but it seems like one of the common questions to ask somebody is, what do you want to do when you grow up? And oddly enough, I got asked that again the other day. But a number of years ago, when joking around with a client of mine, a really good guy, one of those clients we had over time decided that we could move our weekly status meetings to a Friday afternoon over at his house next to his pool, which was a lot better than meeting during the week in suits, especially since we we lived within commuting distance to each other. Talking to him, we came to the conclusion, just don't grow up. Just don't grow up. I think with a lot of this stuff, whatever your passion is or whatever you decide to do, just enjoy it. Warren Buffett talks about how if you enjoy what you do, you skip to work every day. And I think he's absolutely right. Yeah. And it might be one of those things where, you know, you work in a position all your life, you put the kids through college, you do whatever you need to do. But then there comes a point where you retire, go out and do what you, where your passion lies, what you think is a lot of fun. And it could be anything. I remember some years ago, a business associate of mine, was all sorts of upset because his son-in-law, when retiring, was going to open up a bicycle shop. He's retiring. Why? What's the issue? My no, Nobody's married to my daughter is going to run a bicycle shop. So they're financially stable and all. But he was just so set against his son-in-law opening up a bicycle shop. And I remember saying to him, isn't it more important that they're happy? It was more his issue, but I applauded his son-in-law, right? Fine. You did everything you needed to do. He raised three great kids. He put them through college. They had no bills, no debt. He wanted to run a bicycle shop, do nine to five, and then he and his wife would travel. Way to go for it. We work to live. We don't live to work. Yeah. So that's good. So let's talk a little bit about M&A, because I think that's been, especially during the pandemic, it's been a, a really popular thing that's been happening because as businesses can no longer survive, they do the M&A. And I think that we'll probably see a lot more of that for a while. Yep. So if there are some businesses out there that are maybe they're on the verge of that, what's the best way for them to start to prepare themselves 
really to make everything go a little bit more smoothly. What are some of the top things that maybe you see out there that really ends up slowing things up if, because they're just not things that people just don't think about? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I suspect you're asking because I've done close to 30 of these transactions. Thank you for reading the bio. So just so the audience knows, I've done somewhere between 25 to 30 M&A transactions, whether it be on the buy side, the sell side, or the post-merger integration. And it really comes down to being an exit strategy, right? Because when you're, you're looking at this, you're exiting one part of your life and entering a new one. So the number one piece of advice, having done a lot of this, is the stronger your business, the better it's going to go. You're going to get a better valuation. You're going to get a better class of acquirer. You're going to have a lot more say in what your life looks like afterwards. I have been fortunate enough to have been part of acquisitions that were considered a strategic acquisition. So the folks I was working with were being acquired because they were valued and because they thought that they could help the new combined organization go to the next level and be more profitable and enter new markets and all. That is a vastly different experience than working with somebody who has to get acquired because they're running out of money and they're not going to be able to make payroll. So the stronger you are and the more your values and what you're trying to get out of it, the better positioned you're going to be. Now, Everything I do, I believe in homework and research. What I would do is if you think in M&A transactions in your future, again, whether you're going to buy somebody or you're going to sell or you're going to split off a piece, whatever you're going to do, spend your time learning about it. Take classes on it. Business schools are offering more and more classes on M&A. And just taking those and understanding the different types of transactions and how they're structured and the process will really take out a lot of stress and really position you for doing better. Like any other business transaction, never forget the role and motivation of the different players. Your attorney is gonna to look to memorialize the transaction they believe you want. So you need to know what you want and be able to articulate it to them. The investment bankers and the financiers they want to do a deal because they only get paid if the deal is done, right? And clearly some are more, are better advisors than others, but at the end of the day, they generally only get paid if a deal is done. I'll never forget that. An important story. One, one organization I had worked with some years ago really wanted to acquire this one organization because they wanted a presence in a different geography. So we were digging in, doing our, I was part of the due diligence team, digging in, one of the things we found out was the vast majority of this organization's revenue came from a single source. And then we dug in a little deeper. We found out that the primary source of the revenue was a competitor of the folks who wanted to acquire them. So you think about that for a second. If I want to acquire you, but most of your business is coming from my competitor. How long is the competitor going to give you business after I acquire you? Yeah. So we noticed this in our report and we actually during our debrief said, you need to write this in here because the seller was swearing, no, I can do this, blah, 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 whatever. Fine. If you want to do the deal, make sure it's in there that you're going to keep these contracts for a certain amount of years. And then I think we proposed either a three or five year earn out based on revenue. Okay. Firm gets acquired within six months, the revenues go to zero. Why? Because why should this other company give my company now all this business? Why should I feed a competitor? Board went high and right. Why didn't you detect this? Why didn't you, blah, 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 blah. Wait a minute, guys, hold it. 
it's in our report and it was part of the debrief. I never saw it. So we pull it out of our files. Here you go. It never made it to the lawyers. Wow. Yeah. So needless to say, you hear these statistics, which I'm not so sure I believe that 70% of M&A transactions don't work or never realize their full potential. This was clearly one that was in that camp. Yeah. But all they needed to do was just write around it. So again, it's do your homework, prepare, ensure the attorney knows what you want to do and why, so they can memorialize it in the contract, work with your investment bankers, your financiers and all, but remember they only get paid if a deal gets done. So they're going to be inclined to maybe put a little sugar coating on the transaction more than the others. Lawyers more often than not tend to be the sky is falling people because they always talk to you about what's going to go wrong. Yeah. And obviously listen to your accountant and your financial advisors. But if you're going to do an M&A deal, understand why you're getting into it. Understand your values. Understand what you want it to look like afterwards. And make sure you you work your system and your the players in, in your side. That's good. So you work across a, a lot of different areas. You did program management. You're a fractional CIA. You do all of these different areas of business, the cybersecurity. Yep. I did want to take some time and ask you a little bit about how you help businesses as a fractional CIO. And if there's any of the other things that we haven't touched that you want to mention. Thank you. I think we're all a victim of our success. We're all a victim of our success. Earlier in my career, having been exposed to these different areas and working on large projects and managing large projects and working with senior executives and doing strategy and creating, managing programs, you pick up these skills. And frankly, I did my master's, one of the specialties of my master's work was in program management. And what I found that you work these disciplines and they're more alike than they are different. So it, there's a, there's a lot of pieces here. You specifically asked by the CIO side. I've been a CIO for three different organizations including two companies I helped start because when we're in startup mode, I got that thrown at me and I've been virtual CIO on two other occasions. And I know that the reason I was very good as a CIO was because I was focused on value creation and doing what's right for the business. CIOs in my humble opinion that don't succeed are more focused on the way they think the world should work or the technology. They forget it's about driving business value. Yeah. I, and that, that happens a lot. I see it happen a lot with, let me rephrase that. Probably the most egregious, probably the biggest offenders of that are the entrepreneurial startup that basically goes out and gets somebody because, hey, we need a place to store documents. We need email. We need this, blah, blah, blah. Let's hire somebody. They're basically a glorified network administrator. And don't get me wrong. Those people are very valuable. But as the company grows, you've been managing our network. Why don't you become the CIO? And they start to grow. And unfortunately, the job is now growing past them. And most times when you grow past your supply chain capabilities, you have actually broken long before you realize it. So I see that a lot as companies grow where you know, tends to forget that they're there for value creation. I actually have a specific certification in cloud economics. There's, it's one of those things that's all about creating a business model and what's the different costs related to the cloud. And it was, ironically, it was popular before the cloud really got adopted. And now everybody's more focused on, we need people with hands on keyboards because we're adopting. So a few years ago, I went for the recertification. And out of a room of 20, 30 people, 
for whatever reason, about 60% were technology types that were trying to learn the quote unquote business side. And there was this one role play where supposed to be meeting with the business unit head and supposed to be doing some due diligence. And they were shaky about what is this cloud and why should I even think about it for the business? They often have the attitude, whatever the CEO and CIO decide, I'm going to go with it. Even though along the way, they're going to make their own decisions and start throwing darts when they feel it is appropriate. But they'll tell you they're going to do whatever these guys say. So we got this role play going. These technology folks, because when these things go on, I tend to like to take a back seat and watch them before diving in. The, these technology guys start asking about who's your chip manufacturer? Where do you get your hardware from? What are your speeds? How many cores? This is the classic. How many cores do you have on your CPUs? It's like, what? And the guy doing the role play, just as you can tell, tries to steer the conversation and screw with them a little and mm -hmm. actually stops the role play. Says, no, no, I'm a business unit head. I'm a, we want to talk business things. So what did the technologist do? Old joke about a foreigner traveling in a foreign country. They started talking louder and slower. Same things, but they just started talking louder and slower. One of the things that has to happen, especially now, that businesses are realizing that they are more dependent on technology than they ever have, is technologists need to cross train into the business in the same way that th different people in business segments need to cross train into IT. I've seen an influx or maybe more of awareness or melting of the walls between IT and everybody else. I have probably had more people in legal in the past two to three years ask me about how this IT stuff works and tr honestly trying to understand it than probably the previous 10. Yeah, you know, the accounting sense. guys are always trying to dig in to figure out what number to put in what bucket that, but they're also starting to try to understand this stuff. Yeah. So can you share at least one of your client success stories with us? Yeah. Ironically, I just got a, it's funny you asked that because there's one that's top of mind because the former president just emailed me today, letting me know he went over to a different company. So he's top of mind. So a few years ago, one of, one of my clients who I had been working with for some period of time had, they had this vision of creating a new service offering that was very unique to their industry that was subsequently rolled out and was very unique to the industry. It was a bit of a game changer for the industry and others are trying to catch up where basically they're taking three different business units and merging a service offering together and taking it to market as a single offering, as opposed to three pieces that are sometimes sold together. Very different model. Look, they brought me in and said, can you figure this out? So, sounds simple to me until I started digging into it. To pull these three business units together was a central piece. And this central piece actually had operations in Canada, the US and Mexico. They all had different business models, different systems, different processes, different data. Everything was different. So we had to reconcile everything into one and also marry it to the other two business units. And my, the thing I liked about that is reading the documents and getting briefed by the executives. I said, okay, I want to meet two regional operators. You pick them. I want to meet one of your best and I want to meet one of your worst. Okay. Ended up meeting with one of the best first and sat down. He greeted me. I'm coming to his office because the C CEO told him I would be there. So of course they roll out the red carpet and I get whatever coffee I want. So I sit down with him. He starts telling me about the technology. First thing I said, no, no, I want to know about your revenue stream. 
I want to know about your value creation. I want to know about the way you work. He stared at me. He's like, why? He said, because I could design all the systems and stuff in the world. I can create business processes. I can create, I could redo your financials, your spreadsheets, your income statements, your balance sheets. But unless it marries the way you operate, it does no good. This guy stood up from behind his desk, walked around and hugged me. He actually hugged me. Wow. He's, thank you. And he started telling me about all the operational challenges they have. They actually had data that was being re-entered three times because it was being used differently. He's like, my comp plan says I get rated on this, but the reports don't show that. So what we do is we send these official reports over to finance and all, but then we got to redo all the reports to know how we're performing against goals. And then I send them over there. That's ridiculous. And we started looking at it and we recast the business model to fit all these different pieces I told you about. We first thing I did was redo the reporting, right? The income statement. Why start with the income statement? That tells you how you're operating on a monthly basis. And if accounting, which I'm sure most of your listeners do, the balance sheet is a, a snapshot of the business from a financial perspective at a point in time. But though how you move from one version of a balance sheet to another is through your income statement and to some degree your cash flow statements. So let's start with the income statement. And we redid the income statement in a way that these guys got everything they needed up to operate their business day to day to tell how it was doing, where it was going, what the projections were looking like, and they could really manage their business. And then we, mar we, we redid everything around that. We ended up saving, well, we reduced the manpower needs by 12, 12 full-time equivalents. And we took more than $2 million of indirect costs out of the bottom line just by the simple realignment. I love that example and it's top of mind because the president we did that for has now moved on to another job and just coincidentally emailed me today, so. It's amazing, amazing story. Thank so, you, it, and it goes back to what we were talking about. It's all about value creation. If yeah. you're in business, it's about creating business value. If you're a nonprofit, it's about achieving your mission. Military, it's about achieving your mission. If it's you in, in your personal life, it's about your aspirations and your goals. It, it's no different. The targets just change a little. The principles yeah. are the same. It's amazing. So if there's somebody that is listening that would love to get a hold of you to work with you, what's the best way to contact you? There's two easy ways. One is I would say if they called you, I think you know where to find me. <laughs> yeah. The other one is it's Alex Sharp, sharp like a knife. So if you type Alex, A-L-E-X, Sharp, S-H-A-R-P-E, and you put any words like cyber, risk management, you'll find me. It's that simple. I will warn you if you come up with an Irish tenor, that's not me. <laughs> and if you come up with an elderly economist from How Harvard, that is also not me. <laughs> so, Perfect. but Alex Sharp, Sharp Like a Knife, both have an E on the end, just Hit me up on LinkedIn, find me on Google, contact Amy to hear from you. If somebody does contact me, I'd say, let them know. Let me know you came through the podcast. Um, I'm sure Amy and I would both like to know how well this goes. Yeah, definitely. And I'll put all the links down below. Thank you so much for coming on today, Alex, and sharing your expertise. Oh, thank you, Amy. I really enjoyed it. This was uh, this was more like talking to a friend, having a lot a good conversation. You hit some of my favorite topics. Thank you. It's always a joy. Yeah, definitely. If you're listening to this podcast, you want more information about this podcast and upcoming shows, you can visit a call to thrive.com. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful week.